Hello, this is David of Bionic Turtle with a look at free cash flow metrics. In order to illustrate, I have actual data here from the most recent filing for a publicly traded company. That's Radio Shack, ticker RSH. And this is from their 10Q or quarterly report. I've collapsed some of the rows in order to make this a little easier to read. But don't worry, we don't need to look at all the rows. But this is from an abbreviated version of their statement of cash flows. And first, just about the cash flow statement, like the income statement, it's a flow statement as opposed to a stock statement like the balance sheet. So the first thing we want to be mindful of is what's the period. So in this case, I just happen to be using the six month period ending June 30th, 2010. So notice this is six months. It's not quarterly or not annual. It's the first thing we want to be mindful of. What's the period we're talking about? Now, in terms of the statement of cash flow, this is an indirect format. That is under U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, and it's betrayed here that it's indirect by the fact that it starts with the net income. The net income is the bottom line, so to speak, on the accrual-based income statement. I'm not showing that, but at the bottom of that, that net income, sometimes just called net profit, is used as the first line to inform the statement of cash flows under the indirect method. So we start with net income and then we add back the non-cash charges. So in terms of the statement of cash flow, three big buckets, net cash provided by operating activities, or we could also abbreviate cash from operations. So this is cash flows related to the production and sales of the pro company's product or service. Second bucket, net cash used in investing activities, which we can abbreviate CFI, cash from investments. So these are cash flows related to the purchase and sale of long-term assets, plant, property, and equipment, for example, or primarily. And final bucket, net cash provided by financing activities, which we can abbreviate cash flow from financing. These are going to be cash flows related to the company's capital structure. So those are the three buckets. And then just briefly in terms of net cash provided by operating activities or CFO, right? We start with that in income. And then the basic idea with these line items here is we're adding back non-cash charges. So depreciation is amortization are expenses on the accrual based income statement. They reduce income in order to produce this net income number. However, depreciation is not a cash outlay in that current period. So we add it back. So that's the adding back of non-cash charges in order to get back to cash flow. And then the other key dynamic here is changes in operating assets and liabilities. So these are cash, these are adjustments to reflect the cash flow dynamics of working capital or short-term assets and liabilities. So here, accounts and notes receivable. Notice that is uh, what happened is a decrease in the accounts receivable, which is a short term asset, is a source of cash. And so it contributes plus 11 to the cash flow. In other words, uh, 11 million of accounts receivable was finally received in that period and we credit the cash. Inventories, similarly, is a short-term asset. It's a little more complicated by inventory counting. However, all of the things being equal, we can assume here there was a decrease in the inventory of about 39 million, which is a source of cash and a cash inflow. On the other hand, accounts payable, we can infer what happened during the period is that accounts payable as a short-term liability decreased by 100, almost 180 million. If the accounts receivable as a short-term liability goes down, that's a use of cash and a cash outflow. So that ref these accounts here are important because they reflect the changes to working capital. And you can see my calculation here matches the reported number on the statement which is I just start with a net income, add back the non-cash charges, and then reflect changes in the working capital, gets me to cash from operations, 42 million for the six month period. So we've got our three buckets. And then now just briefly, the two cash flow metrics I wanted to highlight. This first one here, I'm not gonna spend any time on. I just wanted to 
to be complete, share what the company reports. This is their free cash flow reported by the company, 16.3 million. They used the CFO number, cash from operations, less capital investments, less dividends paid, which was zero in the period. So I put that there just to show what the company recorded and reported and to highlight this fact that we talk about free cash flow. There are def different definitions depending on who's using the term. So we want to be very mindful of that. It, just because someone says cash, free cash flow reports that does not at all mean that it's necessarily either the definitions that we're using here. Okay, so the two that I'm interested in are, per the CFA, free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow to equity. Free cash flow to the firm is meant to reflect the, the cash flow that's available to all capital providers, that's debt and equity. And so we have cash from operations, that's the 42 million that I'm blocking a little bit, but it's right here. And then we are going to add back the interest expense after all, because we want to get the cash flow before it's available to the debt holders and interest is compensation to the debt holders. So we want to add back the interest. The only little caveat here or important nuance is we want to add back actually interest multiplied by one minus the tax rate. This is to recognize that the tax provides a tax shield to the company. So effectively we're adding back the interest expense and we're subtracting interest times the tax rate simply because just to add this back, we're overstate it because our net income already includes the benefit of a tax shield. So we want to add back interest expense times one minus the tax rate. That really gives us back the true credit or cash flow benefit of the interest expense. So now we are before the debt holders. And then notice this less investment in fixed capital. I'll move out of this out of the way. And this is this line right here, the cash from investments. The idea here is that the investors expect that the company needs to reinvest in its productive capability in order to maintain the free cash flow. So we've got to, we've got to make an assumption about that. This is in fact is an estimate or proxy. If we didn't do that, then the company would just be harvesting its assets. So we subtract that. And so the 42 cash from operations plus the interest expense that's adjusted for the tax shield to get us before the debt holders and then less the reinvestment in long term assets or fixed capital in order to maintain the productive capability gets us back to free cash flow to the firm. That's cash flow that's available or before both debt and equity holders. And so finally, free cash flow to equity. What's the key difference here? Well, here we want cash flow that's available just to common shareholders. So after it's paid to the debt holders, after all the shareholders realize that they have a residual claim that is subordinate to the debt holders. And so in this case, cash from operations again, we start there. But this time we don't need to include the uh, an adjustment for interest expense. It's already included in the cash from operations. We do want to do less investment in the fixed capital. It's the same one we did here. It's cash from cash flow from investments. And again, it's really just a proxy. And finally, if there were re debt repayment during the period, a pay down of principal, we would subtract that as well. After all, the equity holders won't see that cash. In Radio Shack's case, there happens to be zero. And so it's a little simpler here after taking cash from operations and subtracting in the reinvestment into fixed capital, we end up with the cash available to common shareholders or free cash flow to equity of 16.4 million. So we have two different perspectives depending on the constituents or classic constituents we're interested in. Cash flow to all of the suppliers of capital, cash flow to just the residual common shareholders. This is David Harper, The Bonic Turtle. Thanks for your time.